From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to Middle East Focus. There's certainly a lot going on this week with the U.S. midterm elections and developments in various areas of the Middle East. But we're going to be focusing again on the issue of Yemen, the biggest humanitarian disaster in the world today and uh, an area or a a crisis where there have been some possibly significant developments in the last uh, days and weeks. One of them, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, both saying that uh, uh, there should be an end to hostilities, a sort of a new approach possibly from the U.S. administration. Uh, The British uh, Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt calling for action in the U.N. for the U.N. Security Council to revisit this. And uh, the U.N. Special Envoy Martin Griffiths attempting again to convene uh, the parties uh, somewhere in Europe. We're not sure where. Uh, So a lot going on and certainly something that is of great uh, concern to us and certainly many people uh, around the world. With me to discuss uh, these issues, um, uh, one, our old friend uh, Fatima Abul Asrar. Uh, Fatima is currently a senior analyst at the Arabia Foundation. Uh, she, uh, before joining that, she was the Middle East Director for Cure Violence and a research associate at the Arab Gulf States Institute uh, in Washington, D.C., and has held uh, various posts uh, in and around Yemen and is Yemeni herself. Fatima, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. And also joining us is Ambassador Jerry Firestein of the Middle East Institute, uh, who is currently the Director for Policy Programs and uh, Government Relations uh, at MEI and uh, served uh, among many other posts as Ambassador to Yemen and knows it very well. Uh, Jerry, thanks for being with us as well. Always a pleasure. Uh, Fatima, uh, let's let me start with you. Uh, the and with you know again, uh, where are we in terms of the dire situation in Yemen? Uh, which is really driving this concern, uh, both within the U.S. and in Europe, and I would say even in the region, uh, uh, where where are we? I mean, the situation seems to be on the brink of another big famine. Uh, what is the scale of the humanitarian crisis? Well, as you know, the scale of humanitarian crisis is just increasing, and I don't think it's going to get any better anytime soon. So with Mark Lukak um, announcing at the UN Security Council that Yemen now is going to see a huge humanitarian disaster through unprecedented famine uh, should be a cause for concern for all of us. Um, The war is continuing. There isn't any understanding of what a resolution might look like. Um, So the proposal by by Mattis and by um, uh, Secretary Pompeo are welcome. It's a it's a new change, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate quickly on the ground. Um, as uh, we know from Hodeida, fighting escalated in the past few days. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is a pattern that we've seen even before, you know, around uh, a few years ago when the Obama administration was trying to save this and... Uh, the you know then Secretary of State John, John Kerry announced a plan mm-hmm. to for a ceasefire to you know get all the parties around the table to agree on something. Fighting escalated on the ground and we Again. went nowhere. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that you know any time where we have you know these announcements from the U.S., we see a translation on the ground that um, just does not bode well for the many people. The fighting is one and issue. why is that? Is that maybe because different parties on the ground want to consolidate a position before a ceasefire? Absolutely. I mean, definitely there are a number of reasons. So that's one part of it. And, you know, I think, for example, like the um, everybody realizes, I mean, including the, the parties on the ground, that they cannot have a quick victory or a quick win, mm-hmm. you know, from here till then. But yes, consolidate your position. Um, try to show who's in control that, you know, parties on the ground hold more sway than those who are talking internationally. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. all of that adds up and really... In a they, kind of a negative in a feedback negative, loop, as In a were. negative, exactly. Well, Jerry, let me ask you, I mean, obviously, you know, many people would have hoped that there would be a negotiated end to this civil war as one had hoped in Syria and Libya, but that is not... And maybe the envoy, Martin Griffith, will continue to try... But, uh, you know, you've worked long and hard on these issues. How would you distinguish an attempt to establish 
a ceasefire, a freezing of the conflict, easing of the humanitarian situation? What would that look like, given that a, fu a full settlement doesn't seem, you know, near at all? But can can a freeze and an easing of the humanitarian situation be be done? And, and what does it look like and how would you do it? Well, that's actually the way I would approach it, and and recognizing that that um, as we've discussed in the past, Yemen's problems are deep, they're complex. Um, efforts to address them in the past haven't really uh, succeeded. Uh, you know, we we have had this this kind of talk talk fight fight <coughs> situation in Yemen for decades, and the situation that we're that we're confronting today. Uh, really, in my view, doesn't doesn't particularly bode well for trying to look at a comprehensive resolution. I think that what you need to do is identify what are what are the critical issues. Mm -hmm. And and Fatima talked about the humanitarian situation. Obviously, um, I think that that all of the parties, the international community, needs to prioritize establishing a mechanism for addressing the humanitarian issue. Um, to stop the 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 major uh, elements of the fighting, stop the uh, uh, the the conflict in urban areas. Uh, as part of his comments, of course, uh, Secretary Mattis uh, talked about um, the need for the coalition to stop airstrikes in uh, populated areas. But that was followed soon afterwards by uh, renewal of Saudi bombing in um, uh, Sana'a and its environs. So, so you know that's that's one issue. And then the other thing I think that that again uh, we've all recognized that there is. Um, an inherent linkage between the humanitarian situation and the larger economic collapse of the country, because even uh, in those places like Sana'a, like Aden, like other uh, major cities, where there is no shortage of food, there's no shortage of medicine, uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, for millions of Yemenis, there is no uh, income that allows them to go into the market and purchase well, these things. Let me dig a bit into that, I mean, and maybe separate three issues. There's the issue of the fighting itself, which includes the air campaign and ground campaigns. Uh, let's assume that as part of a ceasefire, the air campaigns would stop, uh, that the actual heavy fighting would stop, and there would be a freezing of lines, as it were. Let's take that as, right. a, as a given. Uh, and let's, my question in the second part would be, what elements, because there is a blockade also, uh, of, in a, if you tell us a bit, what is currently the elements of that blockade and how is that impacting the humanitarian situation? Because then the third question is, the economy is bad, people don't have cash, you know, that's yet a third problem. But the things that can be impacted from the outside perhaps are a ceasefire on, on air campaigns and big military activities, and the blockade. Right. I mean, the, the blockade is certainly a factor, but uh, but I think that sometimes people exaggerate the impact of the blockade, quote unquote, on, um, on the humanitarian crisis. Because again, um, you know, you, you've got uh, you, you've got the naval blockade and you've got the clearance process that the coalition uses in order to allow ships to go to Hodeida. What is that clearance process? Could you explain Well, it uh, uh, the ships have to provide the manifest. Uh, they go to, uh, you know, they go to Djibouti. They, they, they do uh, whatever to get clearance by the coalition to be allowed to, mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. go into port in Hodeida. Um, you know, th th how much time that takes is a matter of debate. Uh, the coalition insists that they uh, clear ships to go in very quickly. Uh, but, but again, you know, you've got, you've got two kinds. You've got the humanitarian relief supplies that are being brought in by international NGOs, by the UN, by others. But then also you've got commercial shipping, that uh, that wants to go into Hodeida, and most of the foodstuffs, the vast majority of food and other necessities that are coming into Yemen are coming in through commercial uh, outlets, not through these international uh, relief organizations. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that you shouldn't lose sight of is even after uh, these materials are landed in Yemen, 
uh, whether it's in Hodeid or Aden or, or Mocha or, or any of the other ports, there is a huge um, issue of checkpoints, roadblocks, other kinds of, of issues. Uh, the siege of Taz, where the Houthis prevented any kind of uh, supplies to get into you know, uh, uh, Yemen's third largest city for years, uh, really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- those are also factors. A lot of internal stuff as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, the, the, while the blockade is what draws most of the international attention, it is by far not the the uh, only obstacle to getting relief to the vast majority mm-hmm. of Yemenis. Mm-hmm. Well, Fatima, yeah, let me ask you, I mean, since the humanitarian issue is the most urgent, what things can the international community do to have a quick positive impact uh, I mean, a ceasefire is is one element of it, but given the complex sort of economic and you know situation inside the country, what are things that come top of your mind that need to be done? That's a very difficult question, mm-hmm. Paul. I mean, there's there is only so much that the international community can do. We're on the right track in terms of focusing on the humanitarian catastrophe. Mm-hmm. We're on the right track in terms of calling for you know, better targeting or staying off completely civilian areas um, because that just generates a huge devastation Mm -hmm. in the country. But uh, we're not on the right track in terms of understanding the local dynamics that are driving this. Mm -hmm. Uh, We, a lot of people don't seem to, and officials don't seem to understand what would be the incentives for the Houthi militia or the Saudis to actually come to an agreement around the table. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's impossible for these parties to agree, but I just think that the conditions are not available at the moment for for all of them to agree. Um, The Houthis have a strong grip on Sana'a, on Hodeida, on, you know, uh, on on surrounding Taiz. So they're good fighters, we'll give them that, Mm -hmm. but they are failing on the governance front. Um, You know, the... I think journalists are a little bit naive about this, but they've been recently starting to pay attention that all of these pictures of, you know, the the little kids who are dying from the humanitarian situation are, you know, pictures that have been brought brought up by the Houthi, uh, Houthi officials who are really not doing anything to help these kids, you know, avoid that situation or even give any type of assistance or handout. So they're realizing that the Houthis are using this to their advantage because it sheds the light on, you know, what are the negative consequences of of this war, but it doesn't necessarily shed a light on what they do Mm -hmm. in this war. And how to to fix it. And how to fix it, because that's not what the, what the international community is, is worried about. As an American and or as a as a you know European, you're worried that your bombs might be hurting civilians. Mm-hmm. You know that that your assistance to the the Gulf is going to cause more devastation on the humanitarian front. But what you don't realize is that you know it takes two to tango, and the Houthis can really play that dance very very well. Mm-hmm. So in there, I mean, I guess you know it's not just being aware of that, but Placing pressure on all parties. Mm -hmm. You're doing right by, you know, I mean, when I look at the statements that came out from the United States, I don't think they were addressing the Houthis or Iran. They were addressing the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So if you're addressing Saudi Arabia and Emirates, okay, good. But what does it it sends a positive message to the Houthis that they're on the right track, Mm -hmm. that they are the sole, you know, there is no competition for the Houthis on the ground. And there's one thing I want to emphasize. There is no consent for the Houthis on the ground. Mm -hmm. People want to get rid of them. It was it's very it's, you know, might be very uh, not so clear for an international audience, but. Uh, when they assassinated Ali Abdullah Saleh last year, the in, you know the majority of the General People's Congress Party, which is Saleh's party, turned against them, mm-hmm. and they suddenly turned to the Arab coalition, thinking, "Okay, these might come and liberate." And it was, I mean, it was kind of sad to see that dynamic because they were saying, please come help us, just don't bomb us, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. which uh, w- which meant please find a better strategy to deal with the Houthis without risking our lives. Mm -hmm. That's what they're asking for. It's certainly a very complex, uh, very nasty situation. Uh, But I mean, mean, it's also when you look at U.S. policy, the U.S. has, you know, enormous pressure on Iran, all the sanctions and all of that. 
maybe they don't talk about it much vis-a-vis -vis Yemen, but you know, there's almost very little left for the U.S. to put pressure on Iran with in terms of sanctions. Uh, so some people respond, you know, that pressure is there. And when, you know, I think uh, as Jerry, you know, when, when I've approached Iran occasionally to help out in Yemen, they also haven't been very helpful there uh, either. But let me ask you, what do you think uh, the Europeans or the UN uh, might be able to do? I mean, the U.S. is shifting its policy. What does that mean? Uh, can the Europeans or the United Nations do anything that would help... Uh, reduce, I mean, the, the killing and, and improve the humanitarian situation? I think that that there is a need um, to to look at both sides of the equation here. And, and as Fatima said, for the most part, the international community looks at the coalition. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, um, the, the international community's approach to uh, the Yemen conflict is, is like the old joke about the guy who's looking for the dollar bill under the streetlight. And when somebody approaches them and says, well, uh, did you lose the, the bill somewhere around here? And he says, no, I lost it down the street, but I'm looking here because the light is better. I mean, people, uh, people put pressure on the Saudi-led coalition because we have access to the Saudis. We talk to the Saudis and the Emiratis and the, uh, <clears throat> the um, Hadi government. Uh, and therefore, we're putting all of our attention on that side of the equation and not so much on the Houthi side. Uh, or the Iranians or the Russians, who are also uh, implicated in a sense in all of this, uh, because that's a more difficult uh, conversation to have. Now, the Europeans and the United Nations have uh, an ability to have a dialogue with the Iranians and the Houthis in a way that we really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, if uh, they wanted to be helpful, they could be helpful by uh, increasing the... Uh, uh, the discussion, the incentivizing of the Iranians to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Uh, but that part of the conversation doesn't really happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talked about, yeah. you know, pressure. Yes, it's there existing from the administration. The public pressure is nowhere to be found, you know, because and I feel like that's fundamental and important. When is the last time that I heard Congress, you know, condemning the Houthis for their role in um, arresting thousands of people, abducting, you know, children mm -hmm. uh, and, in, and inciting them to fight? So or on the siege and ties, there is not enough pressure from Congress on the Houthis. Not that they will hold any, you know, sway or no, leverage. No, they don't have but, ties to no, them. And to not that they have ties, but, I, yeah. but, but it, it sort of comes out as, you know, look at who is the violator and perpetrator and who is mm. not. So unfortunately, the war has turned out to be a war of Saudi Arabia on Yemen, when in fact what a Yemeni grievance is, is that they're living under the Houthi control. They want to get rid of that. So yeah, but what's also become is, clear is that you know a military campaign and an air campaign has you know hasn't has made the problem much worse. I mean, I think where, yeah, uh, I mean where I I'm you know, not maybe I mean I think the Saudis even thought and maybe others oh it would be a quick thing and fix the problem quickly. Uh, that has not been the case, and it's gone on and on, and that you know it's just led to a much much worse. Uh, part, of the pro part of the problem is that uh, Houthis are not a conventional power mm. and they cannot be uh, defeated by a conventional power. Mm. So these uh, Houthis are mostly moving like uh, the way Al-Qaeda or ISIS moves. You mm. can't defeat them with an aerial campaign, with a bombing strategy. I mean, you know, when yeah, was the last like time? collective punishment. Exactly. It's people who are paying Well, it's very price. similar yeah. to the situation in Afghanistan and the problems that we confront in trying to um, to uh, defeat the uh, Taliban or force the Taliban to come back to the negotiating table. Um, so so it, it is uh, a very difficult uh, challenge. And there was a, certainly a, um, a, a level of hubris in the, uh, in the Saudi thinking when they decided that they would go in and thought absolutely that they would be able to uh, resolve this issue very quickly. Um, that has turned out not to be the case. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the other, on the other side of the equation, again, you've got the Iranians who for very little effort, very little cost, have been able not only to, um, uh, to bleed the Saudis and the Emiratis for three years, but also to, uh, to seriously complicate Saudi Arabia's relationships with its critical partners around the world, including, mm -hmm. you know, the U.S. and the U.K. And so, 
you know, so again, uh, very little has been done to really incentivize the Iranians or to demonstrate. You talk about the pressure that that the um, that the administration is putting on Iran, which is absolutely true, but none of it is linked in any way, either in our own rhetoric or in the way that the Iranians would understand it, to uh, the situation in Yemen. Mm. Uh, and and unless you make that linkage, unless you make it very clear that one of the issues that is going to drive U.S. pressure on the Iranian regime is the continuation of their support for the Houthis, um, they would not see any particular reason to change mm-hmm. their position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, our time is also almost up. I want to, you know, see, is there any any light, not at the end of the tunnel, but is this issue of a ceasefire and some, you know, stopgap, but important measures, uh, you know, the, the final resolution of this conflict maybe is still years away. Years away, but the Yemeni people cannot, you know, wait in a sense in the current conditions that there are. Uh, let me ask you first, Jerry, and then Fatima, do you s- sense uh, that in the coming weeks, given the change in the U.S. position, new interest in Europe, and so on, uh, that there could be a ceasefire and some developments in the humanitarian situation that could really make a difference in the short run? Well, I think that we'll see. I mean, we'll see whether uh, Griffiths has better luck this time in getting the parties to to come to wherever um, it is that he calls for the next round of, of consultations, mm-hmm. uh, whether there's a new willingness. Hodeida conceivably could put more pressure on the Houthis to um, uh, to negotiate more seriously. Um, uh, that's a that's a possibility. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's uh, you know a, a certainty. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but you know we always have to remain optimistic that uh, that in fact uh, people will make the decision that they would uh, rather pursue um, these issues through a political negotiation dialogue rather than continuation mm-hmm. of this conflict. Fatima, do you see any little bit of optimism uh, for at least a ceasefire and some change in the humanitarian crisis in the short term? Is that possible? When I hear it announced by Abdel Malik Al Houthi mm-hmm. and by officials in Saudi Arabia, I would. Mm-hmm. But currently, as it's announced from the US, from the Europeans... But they're not the main they parties. Are, they are not the main parties. I'm, yeah. I'm going to remain slightly pessimistic about this because the dynamics haven't changed on the ground. So... Um, even if Saudi Arabia goes away, even if the bombing campaign stops, I'm still going to be pessimistic because the parties on the ground, the conflict is not two party, it's not two sides, it's not four sides, it's multi multi layered, and it's going to affect Yemen for you know some time to come. Well, thank you, Fatima Al Asrar, for being us uh, being with us today, and thank you, uh, Ambassador Jerry Firestein. This continues to be a very distressing situation and one that certainly we will continue to to work on and, and analyze. Uh, I thank you all for tuning in uh, today uh, and we will see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.